Welcome. It's Charlene Campbell here with Call on the Midwife. I'm live for you with our class number three, um, Pandemic Preparation for Parents and Birth Workers. Um, every day I hear more <laughs> stories of people who are, for one reason or another, switching to home birth. And every single midwife that I know in this country, in Canada, and in other places as well, but especially here in Canada is where I'm hearing they're all busy and they're actually overloaded. So it's interesting how this is playing out now already. <clears throat> how are you doing? <laughs> here I am with you again. I hope you're well and um, welcome to my channel, Call on the Midwife, that's designed to help prepare people for just what's coming and what's just happening a little bit right now, but I think it's going to become more and more as we go into it. If you're a biblical Christian, which I am, um, I believe we're in the last days and Christ is definitely going to be coming. So it's kind of exciting. Um, I hope everybody's uh, doing okay today. And if you're not, um, I hope I can shed some Warmth. My focus today is on some really specific things. Um, one of them is this particular idea of helping prepare parents and birth workers to know exactly what the parameters are for when to call the midwife. Okay. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to get in with my little beginning part quickly and then go right into the um, the outline that I've got prepared for you, and I think you're going to really enjoy it. Okay, so we'll get to the beginning. I've got a candle already lit for us right here. Uh, for anybody in the world who's feeling sad, um, anybody who's in struggle or, or any kind of abuse situations or anything, I, I'm just sending love. Or if you've been in a post-disaster, you have family that are I'm sending love to you and I'll dedicate my song to you and all the, also these affirmations. I'm just going to say a few affirmations that are applicable to pregnancy, birth, and uh, postpartum for all of us. And they're good for everybody, really. I'll just say a couple of them to get us started. Okay. I accept the way things are. I accept the way things are. <laughs> I like that one. Um, I accept the way I am. I love the way I am. I accept the way others are. I do. I accept the way others are and everything is okay. I am free of the ties that have bound me in any toxic family patterns. I am free to create the person I want to be. I am the master of my mind and I am developing the skills to use it to create the world I want. I know what is mine to handle and what is God's. Nothing more is expected of me. I feel like God does most of it. <laughs> if we're humble and then that mercy covers us and it's amazing. I call my hormones into divine balance. I embrace my femininity and request my feminine divine feminine attributes to come forward. Mm. That was a good one. Okay, we'll do one more. Hope you're well. Thank you for joining me, everyone who's here. Thank you so much. I appreciate you and praise God. Yes, that you're with us, that you're with me. Okay, I'm going to read a couple more and then I'll move on to our song for today, okay? I hope the lighting's good. Um, it's it's actually kind of a gloomy, overcast day here, so it's a little hard to get the good lighting, um, but I'm doing my best. What I need to succeed is already planted within me. I have the right to cultivate that seed. I choose to work with God in learning how to manifest what is in my heart and trust that it will unfold. I call forth the ideas and resources I need to create a happy, productive life and a healthy pregnancy. I choose to move forward and take the steps to manifest my dreams and increase my potential. 
Okay, those are just a few positive statements for you today. Hope that was good. Um, I'm going to go ahead and sing for you. I've got a song. It's called We Are Sisters on a Journey. It's one we sing in the circles quite a bit. Hmm. Well, once in a while when we, when you know, we used to, and then lately we, <laughs> we've been doing things like going to the, um, the secondhand store and buying stuff for kits instead of doing our circles. So we've made, we've had some creative circles. I'm going to play my drum for you. Made by Sean Little Bear, my friend. Okay, here we are. I hope you're well. I want to show you this spiral. Before we start, I'm going to tell you that one of the things I'm going to do is um, I'm going to teach you each time some coping techniques, okay? So one of the coping techniques I'm going to teach you today is called spiral breathing, okay? So just we're going to... Let's put that into our minds. It's to breathe the pain. You, you kind of find the pain. You find the edges of the pain with your deep breaths and the nice in-breath through the nose and then out through the mouth. Nice, long, sighing breaths. And then once you've identified where that pain is and where the edges of the pain are, then you take it and you kind of take your breath and you just imagine your breath going in a spiral and pushing the pain. And you just imagine it pushing it and pushing it. It gets smaller and smaller as it goes out the spiral and it diminishes it. Okay. You plant that idea in her head and wham, there goes the body following the brain. How wonderfully made we are and divine. Okay, here we are. You ready? We are sisters on a journey singing now as one Shining through the darkest night The healing has begun, begun the healing has begun. We are sisters on a journey singing in the sun. Remembering the ancient ones, the women and the The women and the wisdom. <clears throat> we are sisters on a journey watching life unfold, sharing warmth of heart and hands. The knowledge the old, the old, the knowledge of the old. We are sisters on a journey, singing now as one, shining through the darkest The healing has begun, begun. The healing has begun. Woo, there we go. And you can do that in, you know, lots of women singing it together, drumming or playing it, you know, a tambourine is nice. Anything that you can beat on. It's healing for us all to beat on drums and things. It really is, especially in unison in a circle. I've learned that from, it's therapeutic. <laughs> That's why I bring in the music. This is so important to me. And as, heal, as a healer from a brain trauma, I know exactly <laughs> what we need. <laughs> we need love and we need music and we need each other. So anyway, that's the song for today. So let's get into our lesson. I hope you're well today. 
I hope people are doing okay. Um, bless you. Thank you for coming. Um, I do have an attempt. I'm going to make an attempt to do maybe one or two quick Spanish phrases before we jump in. Welcome, everyone who's joined me here. Um, okay. In the kick. Okay, this one, I'm not absolutely positive about some of these. They're getting a little bit tough for me, but that's okay because I still think I'm benefiting from it. I hope you are from the Spanish phrases. Um, indicate el número de hijos que tiene. Indicate el número de hijos tiene. Indicate how many children you have. Okay. Um, indicate el número de veces que ha estado embarazada. Embaraza. Embarazada. Sorry. <laughs> Embarazada. Indicate how many times you have been pregnant. Okay. Um, I think we've done this one before, but I think it's good to repeat sometimes, you know. Um, ha, ten, ha tenido un niño que nació prematuramente. Have you had a child that was delivered pre? maturely. Okay. Those are our Spanish phrases for today. Now, I've got everything <laughs> written out for today because this is a very specific lesson that I'm going to give you about when to call the midwife. Okay. Very important and very specific. And one of the things that we've been doing a little bit the last time was kind of going over some important pain coping. I'm going to throw a couple of those in as well. Okay, and then just remember that when each each of these um, stages of labor, the important ones to really focus on are the more, you know, stronger labor. And one of the things I didn't talk about last time was knowing without checking dilation when the person's around four centimeters or in active labor. I didn't really talk about that. If you're in a low resource setting and you're not checking dilation, you're not a skilled trained midwife. And so that's not part of your, you know, experience or what is safe in a low resource setting. So what um, we suggest, and we suggest this for women to know when to call their midwife also, is to know that if you are having contractions, it's called the four one one rule okay the four one run one one rule and that is that you have she has contractions that are for a full minute so that's from the beginning of one contraction to the beginning of the next contraction okay that's called the four one one rule okay and so um the one one stands for the one minute long. They're lasting one minute long. Their interval is four minutes, which means from the beginning of one to the beginning of the next. So it's about three minutes in between and one minute for the contraction. And that has been going on for a full hour. And with a first time mom, it sometimes can be that that has to be for a full two hours before you really consider that fully ready to call the midwife active labor. Okay, that's I wanted to just throw that in there. And um, I also wanted to also throw in the idea that when a mother starts to moan, we talked a little bit about breathing. But sometimes moms can be squealing or screaming or they have like a high pitched voice that they're sort of using. So what we do is when we use high pitched voices in labor, it can tighten our throat, it can cause tension in our throat. So we encourage moms to moan, to open their throats, open their glottis, because your throat is connected to the same meridian energy path as your vagina, okay, and your cervix. 
And so what you do is you can open your mouth even and go, oh, so with the out breath, you're, you're using the sigh and then you're adding in the moan. And you can do that with her moan with me. Oh, you could use the word. You could go open. Open. You could do something like that with her or something. Something that encourages her, whatever you do. Okay. And then um, another little thing I just wanted to bring in as far as the labor goes is to take your cues from the mom and um, touch how important touch is, especially later in labor and to let the mother lead. And also the vital, uh, like, well, not vital, but the incredible, amazing use of the rebozo. I think the rebozo is one of the most it's just basically a big long scarf that that comes from the tradition of the Guatemalan midwives and Mexican midwives where they they do a really nice gentle jiggly massage with this massage, with this uh, big scarf and they can do it around the mother's buttocks around her belly around her shoulders her neck it relaxes her it's just you can use it in pregnancy and childbirth and it's super powerful pain coping Okay, so there's some nice pain copings for you in the low resource setting. Let's get into our paper. Okay, here we are. I <laughs> hope you're well. Mm. It's completely white outside. The sky is white. There's no sky to be seen or sun because it's just all white. And then the snow is all white and it's been snowing all day. So it's kind of pretty. It's kind of pretty. Yeah, I, I'm enjoying it. Okay. Now we're gonna. Are we ready to go? Let's do this. I've got my heart necklace on. So anybody who wants to focus on my heart today, there it is. <laughs> this is my heart. All right. Okay. Um, now, when to call your midwife and emergency care plan? I'm just gonna go through this, okay? And uh, you, you're welcome to take notes or whatever. I'm not gonna be typing it out on the on this. I'm just gonna go over it, okay? Um, number one, when to call your midwife, any vaginal bleeding during pregnancy. Number two, any sharp or continuous abdominal pain or cramping. Okay. Number three, I'm not going to have enough fingers to do all these. <laughs> That's okay. <laughs> Sudden or significant swelling of the hands, feet, or face, okay? Now, you know, there's changes that occur sometimes with a mom and she gets some swelling and then they go away and they'll come and go or whatever. But if you have significant swelling that's, you know, still there in the morning when you wake up and it's it's really, you know, you should, you should, it's a change from your normal. You should go in and be seen by your midwife. Okay. Um, number five, burning or stinging with urination. Yes. Um, or some of the other things that can be a sign of a UTI. Now in pregnancy, a UTI is a bigger deal than at any other time. Okay. It just is. It's a big deal because if it, if it's left untreated and it becomes a problem where it, you know, becomes a kidney infection, okay, you are looking at uh, the risk of preterm labor. So even a low-grade UTI, a low-grade bacterial infection should be treated in pregnancy, okay? And it should always be tested on the first initial visit as well. Or if anything is suspected, she should be seen and have a urinalysis with a culture so that she knows exactly what's growing in there and you know exactly how to treat it with which antibiotic or however she's going to choose to treat that. You could have a discussion. You could have, you know, a plan, but usually we, we isolate it. In Seattle, this is what we did. We would isolate the bacteria and treat it with a specific antibiotic that was going to cover that because, and then we would go in with high force um, probiotics after to support the, Bioflora for mom and baby to get that 
up as quickly as we can and with cranberry juice and other things to prevent reinfection, okay? And also reviewing important practices of drinking water and how many glasses to drink per day. The mother should be drinking um, half her body weight in ounces plus a few every day, okay? And if she drinks any kind of caffeinated drinks, then that you have to add an extra cup. And I, you know, we try to keep women off caffeine. Um, some women do drink like one cup, of one cup or two cups a day, but we try to keep it to that, no more than that, because it's it's a diuretic. The coffee, okay. Um, where are we now? <clears throat> what other signs? Frequent urge to urinate or marked increase of urination where you just like go, can't stop going to the bathroom. You just have to go all the time, even though you just went. Okay, that's another sign. Sometimes you can also have abdominal pain or lower back pain. Sometimes you can even have cramping already that really isn't uh, preterm labor. But it's mimicking preterm labor, but what it is is it's a masked um, UTI. So if a woman comes in showing preterm labor, labor, then you should always check to see if she potentially, right away you should check her urine to make sure that she doesn't have any signs of a urinary tract infection and that should be treated right away. Okay, <clears throat> sorry, my throat's a bit dry today. It's just a bit dry today. Mm. The water sure is fresh from our well. I love our well. It's really nice water. Okay, we're going to just keep on plowing through this list, okay? Thanks for joining me, all of you who are here today. All right, I appreciate it a lot, your feedback and stuff, Erica. Okay, um, number six. Um, any depressive thoughts that do continue and do not go away, okay? And that could be pregnancy or postpartum, especially in the postpartum. You would be checking every time um, with her about any uh, depressive thoughts or anything like that that she's feeling, okay? And you would be very, very on it if there was anything, especially in the postpartum period. But even in the pregnancy, too, we check really frequently as well. And um, that's why it's so important to have a relationship of trust with your clients. If you, you know, if you're a, a student midwife or someone that's working with people in a professional way, um, building that trust so that, uh, you know, you've broken down the walls enough that they'll actually tell you if they're suffering or if they've got some serious depression or there's some domestic violence in the home that I have found many, many times. Uh, building a relationship of trust right at the beginning will help them to feel safe. And also having an unrushed clinic visit where there's at least 10 to 15 minutes of that visit where you're not actually doing tons of stuff, where they can just sit there and kind of tell you how they're doing. And you can answer their questions if they have a little list or whatever. Maybe it goes for a little longer than that. But it's important to schedule that in for moms so that when they do have something they really need to tell you there's that connection and that relationship and that um, trust built there okay um, all right that was number six so number seven diarrhea okay any kind of diarrhea and uh, intermittent backache with or without a fever okay so we know that all of those can be symptoms of preterm labor, right? Yeah. And then number eight is a fever. Any temperature over 100.4 Fahrenheit or flushing that doesn't stop in one hour where you're flushing and you not it's not stopping. And um, just to FYI, Fevers within the first three months um, can cause serious issues. Many of you know that, but it is a real concern. So like having a fever in the first three months of pregnancy is not the same as having a fever after that. There's a difference. There's a difference. You need to really take it seriously if there's a fever and it needs to be kept 
under the uh, under the um, level of a fever, really. We need to keep the fever down, okay? Um, and so let me just go in here and continue. Where are we? So um, staying hydrated is the key. And, you know, sometimes a mom has to go in and have an IV. That's one of the times when uh, emergency medical services can be really important and intervention is extremely vital. If a mom is dehydrated and she has a fever that is not staying down, say she can't keep the liquids down or something, she needs to go in and have an IV in the hospital. Okay. Period. That's an emergency. Okay. I would say even in any time in pregnancy, that's, I would say she would still need an IV. She should still go get an IV if she has that as an option. Okay. All right. Um, let's keep going here. Now we had on ours to take regular strength Tylenol. Now that was a few years ago. There's been some not very good research coming out about Tylenol. I don't know what else you, you could use. I mean, I know there's herbs and things that you can use, but I mean, technically to get the fever down, uh, I think we still would recommend Tylenol unless something else has come out that's better and less, uh, effect, less has less side effects, okay? So you'd have to look at, that's what I have on our protocol anyway. Um, so they're supposed to take the, the liquids, take the Tylenol and keep the fever down. Um, and if you're not able to control the fever at home, then you need emergency medical treatment such as IV therapy and antibiotics immediately. Okay, number nine. <laughs> We're getting through it. It's quite a long list, so I got to go fairly quickly, okay? I'm going to try to get through this today if we can. I think it would be nice to have it all in one video, okay? Hopefully you can stick it with me, stick it out with me. <clears throat> Number nine is nausea and vomiting that does not go away, okay? Number 10, a sudden decrease or cessation of baby's movements in the third trimester, okay? When it's first noticed, drink a glass of juice or eat a piece of fruit and lay down. You should feel the baby move at least 10 times, okay? This is a different one than the other one. This isn't an emergency situation where you're just, you're not feeling the baby move, okay? This is what we recommend on our paper, okay? That you should feel the baby move 10 times in four hours. And then, um, Number 11, Con and of course, call the midwife if, if it's not, okay, right away. And then contractions, regular with or without pain, yes, any contractions um, that do not change with activity or inactivity. Okay, so this is like before the 37-week mark, because the 37-week mark that is what we would consider the um, kind of the, this is when you are due. It's from 37 weeks to 42 weeks, technically, in most systems. Before the 37 weeks mark, you're considered premature. But really, most babies at 35 or 36 weeks are going to be just fine. And in some, in some, um, different practice guidelines, like in Canada, I think we had some where we could go to 36 weeks in certain cases if the baby was a good size and stuff. I don't remember for sure, but I think there's other places that use 36 or 37 as, the, but we use the set 37 week mark in Seattle area in Washington state. And I think that's what they use here. They're pretty strict about it. Okay. So, but any contractions before that time, if they're regular, even if they don't have pain, that do not change with activity. So they just keep going. Whether you lay down or you go out and have a bath or you go for a walk or you, you know, you have, you know, that's basically it's not going away. Okay. And then low, dull backache, pressure or heaviness, intermittent menstrual-like cramps, 
or thigh pains. And that's when that sometimes people don't realize when you have that kind of like where the pain wraps around your thigh, that can be a sign of early labor. So I've had that with cramping and in labor. And I've, I know other women who have to, where they don't get as much pain in the belly, but they'll have it in their upper legs and in their hips and stuff, you know? Okay. Intestinal cramping or di indigestion and or any other signs of preterm labor. Indigestion is another sign. Such as abdominal bloating, blood tinged mucus, leaking water. Those are a few other things. Now, number 12, any other unusual signs or symptoms that you are concerned about that you feel are urgent? Always trust the mother and give her that caveat. But yeah, um, here's our standard. Here's what we suggest but you know if there's something that you you're not sure about you know you've got something going on you call us don't worry about it you know don't don't fret too much about that if it's not on the list if your gut's saying call you call you know okay then we also on that we of course would have the land numbers the pagers the cell phones and the backup phones so there's always these this progression of like if you can't reach me Here's a couple other phone numbers to try. Here's my pager. Here's, you know, what you're going to need to find me. Hopefully you're able to be found. Not too, not too hard to be found, right? You want to be easily accessible by your client when she needs you 24-7 if you're on call, okay? And uh, that can be grueling, but it's important to take it seriously. That's a very serious profession, being a midwife is. Okay, now I'm going to go through um, labor, you know, different, different things that can happen in labor when to phone the midwife, okay? How to reach the midwife and then how, what, why to call her. A bloody show or loss of mucus plug, the spotting of blood and or thick stringy mucus from the vagina. Yes. And that's the plug coming away from the cervix. As the cervix is dilating, that mucusy, bloody plug is going to come away. Okay, that's normal. And then number two, your water breaks or you have labor symptoms such as low back or abdominal cramping or spotting. Okay. And if you have those before 36, 37 weeks, any of those, you call the midwife immediately. And then if you have them after, you follow the protocol for that, which I'm going to go into. If water is not clear uh, or has an odor, okay, so it might, it might kind of look clear or it might be like a light green and you're not sure or whatever, but then you smell it and it just stinks, okay? That's a sign of an infection, all right? Um, call a midwife immediately if clear. it's not super common, but I'm just going over some of these things aren't super common, but we still need to discuss them. Okay. Um, call the midwife immediately. If it's clear and odorless, then do the following. Okay. So if it's not clear and odorless, um, then, you know, you don't necessarily need to call if you're not having any contractions yet, according to what we had on our protocol. It depends on the midwife standard. Okay. And then, um, but you do the following, call the midwife if contractions are three to four minutes apart consistently for two hours. So this is a 4-2-1 rule. Um, lasting more than 60 seconds or greater, or greater, right? So they could be like, you know, 60 seconds, 90 seconds, whatever, but usually they're somewhere between 60 and 90 usually. Um, if you feel you should call or if you should fall. If or if you feel you should call, you see, there's the caveat again for the mother. So like, you know, you don't want a mother thinking, well, oh, maybe I shouldn't call. No, it's better if she calls and makes a mistake that she didn't need to call than to not call. Right. So you don't want her not calling if she has any indication that she feels like she should call. Um, that's my opinion. anyway. <clears throat> so if you are past the 37 week mark, which is considered term in most in most practice standards where we live, 
um, and your water breaks during the night, but you have no continuous, no contractions rather, or you're in early, early labor and you know you are, and your water's clear, you do not need to call. Now this was our standards, okay? Drink fluids, try to sleep or rest so that you have the energy when labor and contractions begin again and call in the morning to report to the midwife any updates or changes or any time. You can call any time for updates and changes, but just to kind of give her a, a, a lowdown on how the night went and how you're doing, even if you don't necessarily want her to come yet, you should call in the morning. And if your water breaks, okay, here's a protocol for when your water breaks. Before labor, usually this is what it is, okay? Number one, put nothing into the vagina. I know I'm going to go kind of quick with this, so I hope you're all with me and I'm pacing okay for you to get it all. Um, take a drink of water. <laughs> it's fast for me. Mm. Just bring this spiral in again. Spiral breath. You breathe in and you just... You literally see the pain kind of coming and your breath it's kind of literally spiraling out from your mouth, the pain, and it's going out. And it just, it does, it dissipates it. It's a really great intentional um, guided visualization that you can do for yourself or that you can do with someone else in labor. And you can have some kind of spiral piece that she can use as a focal point while she's doing it too, which helps that image is really helpful for the mom, okay? All right. Here we go. So what should you do if your water is clear? Um, you need to drink fluids. Number one, you need to try to rest or sleep. Yes. And um, I think I already went over that. Here we are. You're going to put nothing into the vagina. No tampons. No sexual intercourse. No fingers. And do not check your cervix yourself. Like, do not check your own cervix. It's not sanitary to do it. It really isn't. It's best not to. And it also, it's hard to know what's going on in there unless you have a lot of training and experience. It really is. It's not It's not like an easy thing to learn, checking your cervix. It's like you could put in and go, what am I touching, you know? It takes a lot of practice, a lot of learning, a lot of experience to learn that, Okay. Um, and it really for sanitation purposes, in my experience, just best leave things out of there, even if the water's not broken in a low resource center setting that I'm teaching for. I think that that's a really good idea, too, is just to keep the hands out of the vagina, keep everything out. Um, and then for if the if the water's broken, then no baths and. Um, Unless she's, I mean, I think there's times where people do have a water birth at the end, but it, it's usually like where they're just pushing the baby out already or something and there's no time to have an infection brew. But usually if the water's been broken for a while, we'll go and have a land birth. We'll just have a land birth, even if we planned a water birth, because, you know, just to prevent, especially if it's long duration. And then showers are fine. And then... Um, Practice good hygiene, wipe from front to back after urinating your bowel movement, change your pad regularly and wash your hands before using the toilet. Yes. Take your temperature when your water breaks and every, I have two to four hours in my protocol. Sometimes it would be four hours or two hours, depending on how long she was having her water broken. Okay. And then let us know if it is above 100.4. Fahrenheit. Drink plenty of water. Agua. <laughs> I wrote agua there. <laughs> Remind me. And eat nutritious foods to keep your energy up and rest. Okay. Oh, good. We're getting through it. Yay. Yay. Okay. Hope you're well. I'm, I'm on the last section now. Hmm. And this is an emergency. It's a rare emergency, okay? Now, you know, it's 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 rare, but it's one of those emergencies that if you know how to respond properly, you can you can save the baby's life, okay? So then we always include this little 
information about the prolapsed cord. It's called a prolapsed cord. I'm just going to show you, like, just briefly so you understand what it is, okay? Um, okay, let's put our candle in there. There we go. So a prolapsed cord is when the baby, for some reason, okay, now there can be things that make it more, you more susceptible to a prolapsed cord. So like if you have something, some complications, you know, certain ones like where you have more water than you need inside your uh, amniotic sac, sometimes the fluid is, is more than it really would normally be, then that can sometimes make it more likely that the cord pr can prolapse. Sometimes certain positions make it more likely, but it's a very rare condition. But when it does happen, it's good to understand what it is, okay? So basically, you know, the placenta is attached on the rough side. We talked about the rough and the smooth side. The placenta is attached on the rough side. The baby is, the, the placenta is still attached when the baby's coming out, okay? It, it detaches after usually. Now, if it detaches before, that can be a problem. That's you know, that can be a problem. It's called a placental abruption, okay? But, okay, normally it's going to be attached, okay? And the baby's coming down. Now, say there's quite a long cord and there's a lot of fluid in this, in this um, amniotic sac, okay? In the baby's sac. So the baby's head is not as well applied to the cervix. It's still floating. It's not really down deep inside the um, pelvic, pelvic opening, okay? And what's happened in this case is the cord has come down before the head, okay? And somehow it's gotten in underneath here with this head so elevated and with so much fluid, with such a long cord, sorry, of course, it's still going to be attached to the baby. But let's just imagine it came down, okay? And the mom feels, she's feeling down there, and she feels this cord, okay? She feels this cord. She knows the head's not out, but she feels this cord. That is a cord prolapse. It's when the cord comes down before the head, and it's a serious life-threatening emergency for the baby, okay? So we really want to take it super seriously when we see a cord prolapse. And a mother, the first thing you're going to do, okay? I'm actually going to show you a, um, a diagram of this pitch of uh, this position, okay? Um, but the first thing you're going to do is you are going to get into a hands and a knee chest position. How you do that is you get on your hands and knees with your buttocks up in the air, and then you put your chest flat down on the bed or the floor with your buttocks straight up in the air. Okay, I'm just going to show you a picture. If we have one in here. I think we do because I think we, you know, it might be not one that we do in our classes. But you can just get a sort of an idea. This is my butt's not as high as it needs to be in that picture. But you can get an idea. My, my chest is down, but I should have my buttocks up as high as I can. Okay. Here, here's one. This is the first stage of it. You basically just do that and then just go down. Go down with your chest, but leave your bum up. Okay? Now, you don't get out of that position, literally. You do not get out of that position until someone comes. But here's the steps, okay, so that we've got it all straight. All right, I'm just going to go through it all really clearly for you. Number one, baby's umbilical cord slips into the vagina when the water breaks. It's usually when the water breaks this happens. So that's why kind of knowing, you know, after the water breaks that the baby's continuing to move, um, that, you know, you're, you're not feeling anything at the opening of your vagina. Unusual, you're aware of what's happening to you, okay? Um, and you may be able to see or feel the cord and this cuts off the oxygen supply to the baby. And it's a true emergency requiring immediate transport to the hospital and usually a cesarean section. This is one of those 
rare things that yeah you just get up you just got to get in there right away and get it done <laughs> and then um immediately take the following steps number one grab your phone because if you're alone and you're a mom and this has happened to you you need to have your phone with you that's important so you get your phone then number two you get down on your hands and knees and you drop your chest to the floor of bed and then this position uses the gravity to keep the baby off the cord. Remain in this position at all times. Number three, call 911. Tell them you have a prolapsed cord and give them your address and your location in the house. That's important. If it's at night, make sure the lights are on and that they know how to get to your house and that there's room for them to park and that somebody else, if they're there, can help them find you. Number four, wait for them to lift you off the floor or bed and put you on the stretcher, always with your bottom in the air and your chest on the, the um, either the chair or, or um, you know, the gurney. Your, your chest is down, okay? Call your midwife ASAP after calling 911. There. That's the end of that book. A little paper. Hmm. Okay. Well, just because we have a few more minutes, I'm going to go through a couple of other things with you, okay? <clears throat> now, one of the things that I think is really important for parents is to know how to make a bed <laughs> at home and know how to take care of yourself with you know, supplies. And so what we recommend doing, I'm just going to go through, this is the list of home birth supplies that we would give to our clients. Now, this is more than what I have in my little kits. Those are just emergency kits, okay? But this is a bigger kit that's for what you would have at a home birth, okay? Just to give people an idea, okay? Plastic mattress cover. This can be waterproof mattress cover, old shower curtain, or other large sheet, or a, a, other large sheet of plastic. You may need to duct tape the edges of the plastic so it doesn't slide around. Yeah. Cover your bed. Cover your bed. What I recommend doing is having a cover that's on your bed that's um, over top of your bed already made. So your bed's made once, then you have the plastic, then you have another sheet. And that way, after the birth, you take the sheet off, you take the plastic off, and the bed's made. It's already made, and then you can just put a pad down, because the mom's just bleeding a little bit usually by then. And you just put the pad down, and um, you're ready. She's ready to rest and stuff after that, okay? And then um, a if you're having a water birth, or if you're going in and out of the tub at all, it's good to have a plastic sheet down on the ground to keep water from dripping because the mom will get out and then her body, like everything's dripping all over the place, right? So yeah, having some kind of plastic drop sheet and towels. Old towels, really, really good to have. Two sets of old sheets or one that you don't mind getting bloody. And then 10 to 12 large and eight to 10 hand towels that you don't mind getting bloody also. So they could be used towels that you just get. They could be like just old towels you don't mind using. And then um, 15 to 20 clean washcloths, okay? And then plan a meal for just after the birth for you um, that is warm and nutritious like stew, whole grain toast with nut butter and honey, or eggs in an omelet, or some other way that you like and plan for this ahead of time and write it down on a paper on the fridge with instructions for putting it together. And then have what you can ready at the time and we will put it together just after the birth so that you can eat a good hearty meal soon after the delivery. So it's a really important piece, I think, to have moms really super well nourished postpartum. I think offering them food after the placenta is born 
and they've had a chance to kind of start the breastfeeding process right then. It's almost like somebody either just putting pieces of food in their mouth or even their partner spoon feeding them food, having them eat a fairly decent meal of some kind, or at least eat part of a meal, you know, that can like reduce so many problems. It can help with breastfeeding, helps the mom sleep, it helps her nervous system reset. Um, it helps her bleeding. I think it helps her hormone balance. Everything is really improved. The energy level, the blood sugar, all of it. So a good hearty thing that she really loves, something she really loves. Okay. Um, I would often just make a big breakfast at the birth center, <laughs> you know, like toast and eggs and maybe some fruit and some sliced tomatoes, something that she likes, you know, Oh, well, this is good. You know, so maybe some cheese or something and a nice cup of tea or a big drink or something that she can. So she's getting lots of fluids and she's got her water, um, keeping up her water, you know, and then um, 10 to 12 cotton receiving blankets, two large plastic garbage sacks, two large cookie sheets. This is what we had them gather. Hydrogen peroxide to take blood out of sheets. I don't know if you've ever seen the magic of hydrogen peroxide, but <laughs> it, it is kind of magical out of birth is hydrogen peroxide. It'll just eat blood off just about anything. I love it. And then you can even get spray bottle with the hydrogen peroxide and you can spray the sheets before you put them in the laundry. It's really nice with the straight hydrogen peroxide. And then one large heating pad. We use that to heat up the baby blankets and towels and stuff like that. But usually we have two, one for the baby blankets and one for towels. And then portable electric heater. We recommend a mom and dad have that unless they have a very, very, regulated temperature in their house because we like to keep it nice and warm for baby. We don't want any drafts and we don't want a cool temperature after a delivery. We want a warm, relatively warm in the room so that the baby can be uncovered and breastfeeding and there doesn't have to be like, if it is cold though, and you have to cover, make sure baby's dry, mommy's dry and their skin to skin. And there's a blanket on top to keep the drafts out. Okay. And keep the baby's head covered if there's drafts. Because babies can lose a lot of uh, thermal uh, temperature out of their heads. You can also store things like saran wrap um, to put on top. Just that's one thing, you know, people use if you're, if you're resuscitating is that just that one layer. Um, you can still see the baby. You can still see the color. You can still see the chest rise and fall. But it just gives the baby just a little bit of protection from the wind. Um, factor in the cold on the you know the thermal um, they they just they have to be really dry to make sure you change the linen on a baby really frequently and it's always dry okay let's move on we're going to just finish this um this is the list of the things that the parents are gathering for their home birth okay um Fishnet for the water birth with a small ice cream pail for or other large receptacle. A lot of moms will choose a water birth or they might choose to labor in the water and then, you know, have their baby on land, whatever they decide. Um, if there's any poop coming out of the mom's bum, and that does, it happens. <laughs> you basically think about it. This head is basically pushing down right um you know, right, if the baby's in this good, nice position with the back towards the front, this baby's head is basically coming up, but it's pushing against the rectum. It's just natural that you're going to get, unless the mom's had, you know, a big release, there could be some poop in the water. And so we just scoop it out really quick. But the high di dilution of the water makes it so that there's not a problem for infection, okay? Um, let's move on. So the fishnet and a um, small ice cream pail or large other large receptacle. And then one large hand mirror to view the birth. Okay, sorry, I got a hair on me. Now, this is an interesting one because 
no matter where you're having the baby now, it could be land birth, could be um, uh, water birth, whatever. But if you are, sorry, I got to get my eyes so they're a bit brighter. It seems so dark in here. That's okay. Um, <laughs> if you are, um, you know, having a baby on land and you have a flashlight and a mirror, those are two really good things to have. Now, whether it's the day or the night, you, you could, you'd you have light that way. Um, now, if you're doing a water birth, this is just some FYI, you can put the mirror down into the water, okay? And all you do is flash, like the, uh, flash the light on it, and you can see the birth. If the flashlight is under where the, here's the mom's, you know, where the baby's coming out and you have the flashlight down, just a bit more, but you angle it so people can actually see it. And if you put the flashlight right on the mirror, you'll be able to see the crowning and everything that's happening, okay? With the mom still in an upright position in the tub. And that can be the same thing for if she's on the stool. Say she wants to see the babies coming out. You can put the mirror there and say, hey, have a look. Yeah, there you go. You can see your baby. She can even hold the mirror, angle it the way she wants it or push it to angle it. Now that's really good. It's the same idea. Like I talked about the hormonal cocktail and how creating that hormonal hormonal cocktail and enhancing that hormonal cocktail is going to elevate her uh, hormones to a point where she has the minimum um, poor outcomes. She has the best possible outcomes, the least amount of bleeding, the least and the most, you know, positive um, experience with her baby bonding and all of that breastfeeding and everything. And so, yeah, we really, really, really want to keep those up. And when she looks at her baby, same with the last time I talked to you about having her reach down and touch her baby's head and how empowering it is for her as a woman to feel that gives her a surge of energy to push her baby out and everything. Um, it also bonds her and connects her with the baby and emotionally and I think psychically there's a really really big connection so also the same thing with viewing the baby just being able to see your baby coming out connects you to your baby helps you ground helps you stop being kind of uh, in a trauma space and just helps you kind of get down to business getting your baby out okay let's go on we've almost done this list <laughs> we're almost at the hour mark <laughs> okay um so a good light source, a lamp that is portable. I love headlamps. I think a flashlight too. You need both. A headlamp is great for so many things for a midwife or a student or anybody helping at a birth. Headlamp and a flashlight, okay? And then um, homeopathic arnica, Bach flower rescue remedy, both help with swelling and shock for mother and baby. I recommend both. And then a simple strainer to pour herbs through when we make the sits bath preparation, which we would do every time we would make a sits bath for the mama with herbs. And then we would have it all ready there after she could have her sits bath when she wanted. And then an unopened small bottle of olive oil, which we rarely use, but every now and then we would use it. And, and, but she would use it for the baby. Okay, and rub it all over the baby's buttocks so that when the meconium comes, it doesn't stick and stain. Um, and then sometimes every now and then we would use it for um, helping with the dilation, but normally not, normally not. That's very old school. We don't know, we're mostly hands off. We deliver mostly hands off, with the, either the father helping or the mom helping or just a gentle delivery into our hands, okay? Um, and then... Depends on the situation. Sometimes we have to be more in there. It really does. Um, baby wipes or paper towels and a box of tissue. Now those are non uh, non biosustainable products. I I recommend the um, eight by eight double ply flannel squares and the ten, twelve by twelve double ply flannel squares. Myself and um, witch hazel. Makes a nice um, astringent to put on them for wiping. Okay. And then uh, two gallon size Ziploc bags. We put the placenta in that. We put the placenta in the Ziploc, two Ziploc bags so that it's together there for the mom in case she decides to have a placenta 
encapsulation done or a tincture made or sometimes they'll have like an artwork made plus the tincture and the encapsulation that's what most of my clients did with their placenta which is full of their own hormones that helps them with uh, postpartum depression it can help with all kinds of stuff okay if you haven't heard of that it's a really big thing all over the place and yeah a lot of people did it in seattle and they do it here too, I think, yeah. Okay, um, what's next? An oral digital thermometer. Yeah, we always want the mom to have her own thermometer so she can take her own temperature, either postpartum or um, in pregnancy, and then also take the baby's temperature as well, okay? We have them log it for the first few days, the baby's temperature. And then... Um, Two to three medium-sized metal bowls to use during the birth. Those are like the best things in the world. Metal bowls, stainless steel, probably about, you know, not too, not too big, just about the size of just a bit bigger than the placenta, you know, a nice good sized metal bowl. Okay, we're almost done. How you doing? <laughs> we're getting there. Okay. Uh, lanolin or lancinol cream for breast healing. Some women like that especially first-time moms um, for cracked nipples can be really helpful. Um, and a flannel sheet to be put in the dryer in late labor with several towels for warming up mom after the birth. Yeah, moms can get cold after the birth and, and just a nice warm uh, flannel sheet. I've always found it really, you know, you're giving her her toast and her tea, you're wrapping her in her flannel sheet, her baby's all cuddly, everything's nice and calm. It's a good good energy. It brings the oxytocin up right where we need it for breastfeeding and for mom to, you know, have perfectly good involution of her uterus for everything to go back to nice and normal. And that's, we really have those intentions that we set when we do the, when we give her the teas, when we give her the, um, we might give her like a fresh shepherd's purse tea with some cinnamon in it and say, here, Drink this tea, it'll help your uterus contract nicely and everything go back to normal. We set that intention and we also put that image in her mind and we give her that impression, which is she's very impressionable. Women are very suggestible and very impressionable during pregnancy, birth, especially during labor and especially immediate postpartum. So we can use that to her advantage by saying these positive statements to help imprint that and help her integrate and move in that direction in her subconscious and conscious states. Okay. Um, and lots of ice in the freezer. <laughs> okay. I'll do the rest of this later. It goes into the food and drink and some other things. And then just to close off, I want to give us some kind of quote here. Let's see if we can find something. Now this is the one that wants to be said. Okay. <laughs> well, this is a pioneer midwife, okay, um, who said this. Here's a little picture. Here's another nice one of the breastfeeding, okay. These are both by the same person. But I'm just going to read one of them. It says, I have brought over 1,000 babies into the world. Once again, I give thanks to my heavenly father for his help and the strength the Lord has given me. For without it, I could not have rendered this service to my sisters or our community. So yeah, she was a pioneer and she had, I think she had only lost one mother out of 6,000. And it was like in those days, that was unheard of. That's still her stat to, to this day. So praise God for the pioneers who came before us and I hope we can be as valiant as they were. I want to show you something just because I can and I love this book anyway. I want to show you this. Now this is quite graphic, okay? Please be aware it is graphic. But this is birth, okay? You can almost see the euphoric look in her eyes. This look is like it could be from the farm in Tennessee. I kind of recognize some people, but um, I'm not sure. But you see how in control mama is. She's calm. She's supported. She's got her partner, her midwife. 
she's touching her baby there and it's really sacred and really holy and really empowering. So I hope you're all well. Um, bless your day. It's been wonderful. And thank you everybody for joining me. Um, and I appreciate your input and your, your support. So que pasa una buena dia. That means have a great day. Que pasa una buena dia. All right. Adios. <laughs> Bye-bye.